I wanted to showcase some high res mass spec data and why it's useful to acquire samples in using these types of instruments. So if you're not familiar with high res mass spec, that's when we are acquiring data with an instrument that's capable of resolving the mass to charges with three or four decimal places. These are quadruple time of flight instruments, orbit traps or FTR ICRs. Why is it useful looking at this data? Well, we can take any of these masses, predict a formula, and do unknowns analysis instead of having to buy a standard every time. So I'm going to show you how we identify some small molecules in this particular sample. This was a mixture of small molecules, and in this case, there was diazepam in there, which is a benzodiazepine, which has a chlorine on it. We also have a formula for it, C16H13 chlorine N2O. So we're going to ask the software to help us identify if this molecule was really in the mixture. So I'm going to plug my target source in. I'm going to look for different charge carriers. And this is electron spray ionization. So we're getting protonated, sodiated, and potentially potassiated charge carriers. I'm going to look for formulas or molecules or masses that correspond to that formula within 10 ppm mass error and we'll discuss what mass error means in a moment so let's run through this workflow so the software has identified a peak at 2.7 minutes with masses corresponding to diazepam and in this case to the protonated charge carrier as well as to the sodiated charge carrier it's created a peak out of the TIC, the total ion chromatogram, because it's using those masses, 285. You'll see that corresponds to 285076097. And it's created a, a extracted ion chromatogram, a little window in which the intensity of only those masses are being monitored. So the software has found some ions, uh, in this case the protonated and the sodiated ones, and they were matched within 10 ppm mass error. So if we just look very briefly what the software returned in terms of mass error, in this table we can see the uh, mass error. It's trying to find it. Um, so there's a useful feature. We can say add all columns and remove empty ones. Then we can very quickly zoom in. In this case, it's 2 ppm mass error. Now, what does 2 ppm mass error mean? 2 ppm is 2 parts per million. And if you are un uh, unsure of these calculations, have a look at my website. Um, for further details, I'll provide a, a link below. So we found this molecule with an average of 2 ppm mass error. And is that enough to confirm the molecule with this formula was present in the sample? Yes. Uh, ooh, uh, and let me tell you why. Because we can look at all the ions, all the mass to charges that were found, and we can calculate based on the, the isotopic distribution of these mass to charges that they correspond to the formula, and we gain confidence by looking at each isotope log. So in this case, why are we seeing this isotope pattern? We're seeing one here, and then at approximately plus one Dalton onwards, another Dalton on, and then at plus three Dalton on from the main peak. So this is what we call the monoisotopic mass, when all the carbons in this molecule are carbon-12. But remember, we have carbon-13 at 1% natural abundances. So there's a chance event that one of these carbons in this molecule becomes a carbon-13. And that's why we see a peak here. 1% of all the carbon of that population is actually carbon-13. Or there's a chance, a statistical chance, that there's carbon-13 in. That's why we see a peak at plus 1 Dalton. So why do we see a peak here? Well, if you notice, the molecule has a chlorine in it. Chlorine has two isotopes, one at 35 and one at 37, and they are removed by two Dalton. So we're actually getting an isotope pattern for a chlorinated molecule, and this is 
very characteristic. You can also infer something based on the intensity of these isotopes. So what is the relative intensity of this mass to this mass? So that's in a very brief nutshell how we can get a bit of confidence. So these little bars that are inferred are actually the theoretical expected isotope spacing and abundances for our target formula. If we go look what the software has identified in terms of that, it's identified from our molecule that there was the calculated mass to charge and the um, observed mass to charge was there. So it's then done a calculation to derive the PPM mass error. So what is the calculation? We take the observed value minus the theoretical value. So observed value minus theoretical value divided by the theoretical value times a million. And that gives us PPM mass error. So what does 2 ppm, 2.6 ppm mass error mean? It means that th there was a very small difference between this mass, if you can see 0797 versus 0789. And within the community, a 5 ppm mass error is accepted to confirm a formula at this stage. As instruments become better, that might also change. Okay, so what does this line mean? It means that for the theoretical formula, when all the carbons are carbon-12, for the monoisotopic mass, we have a 2.6 ppm mass error. Likewise, calculations were also done on the second isotopolog, 286. We know the theoretical mass of this mass-to-charge ion for that formula should be this. We are getting a slight difference and that slight difference is calculated into the PPM mass error. Likewise for when we have the chlorine 37 is isotope log, that calculation is done. And all of these values are weighted and summed, and then they are computed into the final score value, which is 2.07 PPM mass error. That's quite nice to see. Um, what else did we see? Well, there was also a sodiated adduct. What does that mean? It means during the ionization process, sodium is also lodged in there with the molecule. It's stabilizing that gas phase ion. So, and again, we can use our mass error calculations to gain a bit more confidence. In this case, for the sodiated masses, we could see 307, which co corresponds to the carbon-13 isotope sorry, to the monoisotopic mass, and then this uh, plus 2 Dalton isotope log, which corresponds to the chlorine-37 isotope log. So we've got a peak at 2.7 minutes, and we getting mass information to suggest that that formula is there. In the next video, I'll show you how we can get some more information by fragmenting that peak and using the fragmentation pattern to gain more confidence in confirming that is, this is really diazepam.